So hey everybody, welcome. Um, so this is the River City Whiskey Society's uh, whiskey tasting for, what are we in, June? I mean, does time even matter anymore? Um, so yeah, whiskey tasting for June. Our uh, virtual one, I think this is our third or fourth that we've had to do so far. Um, today we have David from uh, Glen Allocky, and this is a, a, a space side scotch that JVS and Impex just picked up. So we're really excited about it. I uh, actually had the pleasure of uh, sitting, sitting in on a, on a training yesterday where we got to get a lot of the nuts and bolts of the distillery and its history figured out. Um, I know some of you guys have had it before and I know there's a lot of newbies to it today. So this will be a really fun uh, opportunity to, to learn about it. And then uh, also, of course, these, all these bottles will be available for purchase through uh, Roco's website. You know, so the same place that you got your tickets <laughs> Um, Rose probably going to send us a link at a certain point where you'll have some special discounts uh, on it. So with all that said, um, if you guys have questions or anything during it, like I encourage it to go through the chat at first and then at the end we kind of open it up a little bit more. But it, there, there will be times where, you know, if you want to give some tasty notes or anything like that, you know, feel free to, to unmute yourself. I am going to highlight uh, or spotlight David's uh, picture so that way it doesn't do that whole jump thing where you get sick by the time it's all said and done. So, but if you guys have questions, you know, please uh, type into the chat or, or do that little hand raise thing. It's adorable. So um, just let us know. So with all that said, uh, David, why don't you take it away? Oh gosh, I'm looking awfully big now, Drew. Um, <laughs> Drew thank, you, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, and River City guys, uh, guys and girls, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to come along and join you this fine evening, or should I say afternoon, one o'clock in California. It's nine o'clock in Scotland, in Edinburgh. It's been pouring with rain all day. Um, thankfully, it has cleared a little bit now. So it's uh, slightly different weather for me over here than what you guys are getting. So anyway, thanks again for having me. So Glen Allocky Distillery. This is going to be a low key absolutely informal conversation if you guys don't ask questions i'll forget to cover off stuff so please don't hesitate to jump in what does the name mean big old scottish word there okay glenn and i'm sure many of you know this already so apologies if i'm covering up something that you already know whenever you see glenn that is the old scottish word old scottish gallic word for valley uh so hence you've got glenn donna glenn Fiddy. Glenfiddich is Valley of the Deer, Glendonach, I think from memory, is Valley of the Brambles. Glen Allocky is um, Valley of the Rocks or Valley of the Stones. The second word, Allocky, the old, is the old Scottish Gaelic word for rock or stone. So we are Glen Allocky, Valley of the Rocks, Valley of the Stone. And, you know, and from that, that was where we got a slightly more unusual font style. Um, it's kind of chiseled rock style. And you know, for all you guys out there that like to crack the funnies, I've heard it all before, Game of Thrones, The Lord of the Rings, Jumanji, Flintstones, I've heard them all before guys. So if anybody's got a new one, you know, you feel free to join, feel free to share it. So we took our branding style from our name and from in the Northeast of Scotland, there's a lot of Pictish standing stones as well, which have sweeping runes carved into them. So they're all got these sweeping style styles and images. And that was where we took our branding from to get it going. So that's the name, Glen Allocky. We're a space side distillery, a space side distillery that is over 50 years old. But very, very, very few people have had a chance to try and know much about Glen Allocky. Maybe one or two independent bottlers uh, have released a, a, a cask here or there. But on the whole, not been possible to pick up Glen Alarchy. So why was that? Glen Alarchy, way back in the 60s, was built to be used exclusively in blended Scotch whiskies. It was built by McKinley and McPherson, which are the spirits, or was the spirits arm of Scottish and Newcastle. Scottish and Newcastle were a famous British brewing company, which uh, subsequently got bought over by Heineken. Um, but they had a spirits arm called McKinley and McPherson back in the day. So they built Glenallachie Distillery back in 1967, 
first production run was in February 1968. They used it in their McKinley's blend, um, and then like like all whiskey distilleries, are almost like, like all companies, times turn, the, the years turn, the decades uh, roll on. The company changed ownership, uh, fell into the hands of Invergordon distillers, um, and um, at that point, Invergordon were the only company to actually ever mothball Benashi. So I think it was from 1985 when they took ownership to 1989, Glen Distillery. That's the only time it's not been in production. Otherwise, it's been in full production from the 1960s right through to the current day. Um, what happened next in the timeline? Um, Campbell Distillers, owners of Chivas Regal, Royal Salute, um, Glen Livet, purchased it. They purchased Manalki Distillery from, uh, from Ember Gordon. These then started using it in blends I've just mentioned there, um, and also started to swap over some of the stock with Diageo and William Grant, etc. Okay, remember the blenders are always swapping a lot of casks behind the scenes, and that, that incidentally is one of the reasons that there's a standard filling strength of 63.5%. It's so it's easy to swap one barrel of Glen Allocate for one barrel of Glen whatever, okay, if you're a, if you're a blender. So that took us 1989, 2000, I think 2000, 2001, Pernod Ricard acquired Glen Allocate Distillery as part of their acquisition of Campbell Distillers. They increased the production again, and when it was first built, I think you could do something like one million, one million. then it got increased to three million liters of alcohol. When Pernod Ricard took, over, took ownership, they increased production potentially to 4.4 million liters of alcohol, okay? So you've got this potential, this big distillery in Speyside, right in the heart of whiskey making country, but nobody's ever seen it as a single malt, okay? So keep rolling forward through the years, and you get to October 2017, and that's where things start to get exciting, um, particularly for me because I was involved in it. Billy Walker, the former owner of Benria and Glendronach Distilleries, and he had sold those to Brown Foreman in October, uh, sorry, in June 2016. So a year before he'd sold his previous company. In October 2017. He purchased Glen Allocate Distillery from Pernod Ricard. So he bought the distillery, he bought the brand name. Crucially and most importantly, he bought at that point 36,000 casks of single malt going back to the 1970s. Okay, so we've got a huge portfolio of stock and we've got old stock. And that makes us a little bit more unusual than. Um, than most whiskey companies out there. There's some fantastic whiskies out there by some of the younger guys. Um, Aaron's fantastic, Kilhoman, one of my personal favorites. Um, there's other ones out there. Um, <clears throat> Dark Mill, which is very, very small, young, got some great whiskey. We're in a similar boat to these companies. As a company, you were young, but we have this big distillery and we have all this stock. So that meant that when we launched our core range back in June 2018, and remember we bought the distillery on October 2017, in June 2018, we were able to release a core range of a 10 year old cast strength, a 12 year old, an 18 year old, and a 25 year old. Um, and now's as good a point as any to say everything we release is 46% alcohol. Or higher, everything we're going to try tonight is 46% alcohol or higher, unchill filter, and um, natural car. Okay, so I'll come on a bit more of the history, a bit more about the distillery. I'll show you a few pictures to help set the scene. But I believe, Drew, I believe we've got some whiskey to try tonight. So it's nine o'clock in Scotland, so I think we should, we should, we should be getting going. Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, we've got 12 year old. 15 year old, 18 year old, 10 year old cast friends, and you guys have got a 25 year old. Is that right? We've got five whiskies to try tonight. That's correct. What I suggest we do, we'll start with the 12, then we'll do the 18, 
Uh, Scott, I hope this hasn't messed up you a little. I saw you at the beginning arranging them all. Apologies, I should have said that. <laughs> we'll start with the 12, then the 18, then the 15, then the 10 year old cast strength, and then for you guys, the 25 year old. Unfortunately, I've cocked up, as I said, I don't have the 25 year old. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a single cast for you chaps are trying the 25. Okay. So, does everybody have a 12 year old? An allocate to hand. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, fantastic, Sam. So this this is a core, this is a heart of a range, okay? For an allocate 12 year old. This will be this is the one that's closest to Billy's heart. Because this is the one which will get the greatest distribution for it. This is possibly the one that will introduce most people to an allocate. Um I'm going to touch very, very briefly on something just, and I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on it. I mentioned when we bought the distillery, we acquired 36,000 casks by um, almost three years ago. Fast forward to the current day, we now have in the region of 50,000 casks of Benalaki. Remember I mentioned back in the day that uh, Campbell Distillers and Pinot Ricard would swap stock with other blenders? Since buying the distillery, Billy Walker has bought back a huge amount of these casks, so we have an awful lot more casks at the distillery now. What I'm going to, all I'm going to say is the longer we own Glenallachie, the more casks we get back under our ownership. The longer we get these casks in the wood of our choice, and the greater variety of casks we get in choice, you're going to see Glenallachie continue to evolve. You're going to see, you guys are coming in at the beginning of our journey. You're going to see the whiskey evolve and move forward. And it will not be a revolution. It won't change style. You just see things deepen and go on a slightly, perhaps a slightly different journey. Okay, so watch this space on this. The one that we're going to be drinking tonight is one of our earlier bottlings of Manalaki 12. 46% unchilled filter. Some first fill bourbon in there. There's some PX Sherry, Hogsheads, and um, Butts. A little bit of Oloroso and a little bit of Virgin Oak in there. Okay. So, guys, I'm not going to tell you about tasting notes as such, because if I tell you what Billy's tasting notes are, what I get, that starts to lead you guys a little bit. I'm just going to say, Slange, thanks for letting me come and join you. I'll leave you for a second, just to enjoy the drama on your own, and then I'll come back. Formulate your own thoughts for what you're finding in the Glenallachie 12, and then I'll come back and perhaps introduce you and, and clarify in some of our classic tasting notes. Okay. So, Slange, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for letting me join you. Cheers. And, David, while we were drinking this, uh, one of the things I was hoping that you could touch on was mm -hmm. uh, the quick turnaround that Billy did from selling. Ben Riach and Glen Ranji, and then the very next year getting a group together and buying this distillery. Um, because that was something that really stuck out to me in our last conversation. Because it was just kind of like, okay, you kind of did it, like you made it, you sold it for all kinds of buku dollars, and then you just went right back into the fire to restart another distillery. So, if you could talk about some of his motivation for that, because this thought was really interesting, and I think it speaks to the passion that he has for this whiskey. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, again, just a little bit of background there for anybody that doesn't know. And that's a great question. Dude. Billy Walker is in his 70s. He will now be 75, I think. And I'm not, not that I'm being ageist in any way whatsoever. It's just a bit of background information. So why does a guy that sells in 2016 uh, three distilleries, Brown Foreman, $485 million? Um, fair enough, he had two business partners so he didn't pocket but he as we would say in Scotland he pocketed a fair old wage you know um, he's got a lot of cash under the back it's his nose is touching the ceiling um, so why, why why not go and buy a yacht go and retire you know um, this man lives and breathes whiskey um, you know he gets up when he goes up and visits the distillery um, a little fly there he gets up and leaves the house just after 4 a.m. so that when he gets up to Speyside, he is there for the production guys arriving at eight o'clock. You know, this is a guy in his 70s as driven and as passionate about whiskey. And that, that's not BS, that, that is actual fact. 
up and out of the house to the back of 4 a.m. so that he is there for the distillery guys, the production guys in my room. He lives and breathes whiskey. And do you know, do you know what, Drew? I'm, I'm going to tell you something else here. Do you know he, that last week he was super excited? Super excited. Why was he super excited last week? Because he got a, a whisper that there might be some distilleries coming up for sale. <laughs> and he's one, you know, the, the, the guy lives and breathes whiskey. He drives us, he's our greatest asset and our biggest pain in the backside because he's just so driven and so focused. And whiskey, whiskey, whiskey. When can we bring out the 21 year old David? When can we do this? What do you think of these cast Davids? We can bring these out. Um, it's tremendous to work from. Um, I do a lot of I just keep my mouth shut and I listen and learn from him because his knowledge is phenomenal. Um, you touched on time scales there, Drew. Um, I think anyone that knows Billy would say that he's perhaps not suited to work with a large American uh, company. It, it would be too confining for him. So I think perhaps, don't quote me on this, but I think perhaps as the Brown Foreman deal was coming towards a conclusion. I think perhaps Billy it was already putting feelers out to his friends across the industry um, and looking for uh, a, a new project. Um, you know, and and why Glenallachie? Why did he buy Glenallachie? Well, he's a blender. Billy Walker's a blender at heart. Um, so he knew the whiskey. He'd worked for it with it at many years, right back to his days at Inver House. He knew there was a huge. Uh, stock, he knew there was a lot of stock, so he knew there was quality whiskey, he knew there was a lot of stock, uh, he knew there was aged stock, uh, and it had never really been out of a single wall. So it was a blank canvas for Billy to, to launch and to work with. Um, rather than perhaps if he'd bought something that was already out there and maybe had to, you know, it might have been in supermarkets or travel retail or whatever, he didn't have to, uh, he didn't have to do that. Try and get this bit of hair to come in. You know, this is what happens when you cut your own hair. Look at, look at this. It's got, got a little bit going awry at the back there. So, uh, it's just it's, it's sexy just popping out. That's what it is. <laughs> do that. Okay, I'll snip that one off. Um, so, Glenarchy 12. Classic Glenarchy notes for me, and I don't have it. I don't have a great nose of palate. I'll be, I'll, I'll be quite honest with you guys. I know what I like, I know what I don't like. Um, but what I get in the Glenallachy 12 is start to get that classic Glenallachy tasting notes of honey, butterscotch, toffee running across. And I get this running across most of the expressions. Um, but there's a little bit more kind of mint and eucalyptus, something just at, just at the back and a little bit more depth and a little bit more edge. Maybe something as well, the virgin oak you're getting coming through. Um, this one we're, we're trying just now is not as heavily sherried as the 15, which we're going to go for later on. Um, so you're just getting a little bit more different in the nuances of the different woods there. Okay, uh, a great question there from Scott. Uh, I'm going to say it's PX also and Virgin. So some of this will be 100% uh, bourbon mature. Okay. Um, some of it will be bourbon re-racked into new PX wood. And I don't know if some of this will have, Billy's also, some of the older sherry woods, he's also re-racked into new sherry wood. So we, we do a huge amount of re-racking at the distillery. Billy's always moving things around and it does not necessarily could come out of bourbon and then go into a sherry cask and then that's it. He'll keep visiting it and visiting it and then he'll move it out. And then another kind of wood, to so take it in a different uh, different direction as well. Um, so in there, there'll be 100% maturation bourbon, there'll be some sherry finish, um, there'll be some 100% sherry maturation, and there'll be a little bit of virgin oak finish. And, uh, and the virgin oak is American oak, uh, medium toast. Okay. So then these are these are these are all blended together, Scott. They're all batted together. All these casks um, are all. Back is married together and brought down to 46% and bottled unchill filter. Okay, hogs, does hogs head always mean ex bourbon oak? No, not necessarily. You, you can get a bourbon hogs heads and sherry hogs heads. 
Does bot always mean sherry cask? Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, it does. So sherry bot is a big cask. Uh, you're talking 500 liters. Um, a bourbon's 225, um, and I've never seen bourbon. And if I think it'll be lost, Sam, you, Drew, you guys might know a bit more than me. I think bourbon's always got to be in the smaller cask. I've certainly never seen it in the big. So best of my knowledge, stop, but it's always a sherry cask. Okay. But very good questions. And these, if you don't ask me questions, I will not cover things off. So what else is happening at Benalke? Ah, good. Banana, banana, absolutely banana. There's a real fruit note you'll get across some of the Glenallachies. Um, you know, I did a tasting, one, one of the wood finishes, uh, I think it was a Moscatel, with real fruit capping. It was uh, apricot, um, uh, citrus fruit, everything just really zinging out there. So um, it is great whiskey. It is absolutely fantastic whiskey. You know, I don't know how many of you guys know Ralphie.com, the, the blogger, and um, he has, give or take, he's got about 100, 120,000 followers, uh, of which I think roughly 50% are based in the USA. He picked, I think it was last year, he picked Glenarchy 12 year old as his whiskey of the year. He just said it's a great, balanced, all rounder value for money. Um, he thought it was fantastic whiskey. And that's it. what we're drinking tonight is one of our earlier bottlings of Glenarchy 12 year old. Just watch and see how this uh, how this develops over the next um, the next few years. Um, yeah, this Sam clarified bourbon's 200 liters, hogsheads 250. Um, so a butt will be about 500. Then you get four pipes, which can be up to about 700, etc. Uh, another great question coming in: Is there a marriage recipe? So we we talk about um, we talk about Billy's Bible. Billy's Bible. Billy has evaluated damn near every single cask we have at Billy. Not quite them all, but almost every single one, and he's rated them in this big hefty tome. If you ever see Billy walking around with big folders under his arms, that, that that's a secret to Glenallachy. Billy's Bible. So Brian, to answer your question. There is a kind of marriage recipe, and, and it will vary. Um, remember, as a master blender, whenever Billy or anyone else, whether it's Johnny Walker or Glenn Terry, you're trying to look, you're trying to get a bit of consistency, um, but but keep moving the product forward as well. Particularly at Glenallachy, where we're all new. <clears throat> so there is there is a recipe. Some of the newer ones, bottoms will be a little bit more PX led. Um, this one, off the top of my head. Is mainly first fill. Now I'm trying to remember from two years ago. Um, is mainly first fill bourbon, a little bit of sherry and a little bit of virgin oak. Okay, but the predominant is bourbon element. You will see, perhaps you might see Glenarchy getting a little bit more sherry as the time goes by. But the recipe and the percentages is a is a bit of a moving piece, Brian. It will it will change a little bit. Okay. Yeah, these are great questions. When you when you ask all these good questions, it means that I remember stuff. And I, I don't have to try and dredge through my uh, my soggy mind to see uh, what, what I'm going to say next. Okay. Um, Alrighty, so what else have we done? So we bought the distillery. Why don't I, I'll maybe share my screen quickly before we go on to the next whiskey. Well, let me, let me, let me has MD been to Glenarchy? Has MD actually ever visited the distillery? Probably not. So let me rephrase the question. Has anybody been to Aberlour or McAllen distilleries? Right, there you go, Brian. I can see you raising a hand, but I'm not sure who else is. Do you know what? If you were heading south, if you came out of McAllen and turned onto the, the main Elgin Abbey Moor Road, heading south, you come out of Aber Aberlour distilleries on the left, and you're heading up the hill, Glen Allerkey, it just sits right on the left. If you came out of Aberlour, up past down, and looked to your left, down a lane, you'd be able to see the, to the end of the warehouses. See the amount of people in space I even, that when we bought the distillery, we were like, wow, we never even knew when Alakey was there. And that was simply because, laterally, with a, under the ownership of Colonel Ricard, they focused on making Aberlour, Glenlivet, and Scapa global brands. That was their push and that was their priority. Sure, they had other brands they did a little bit with. They did a little bit with Vermeer before Billy bought it. They did a little bit with um, 
lawn mower, we did a little bit with wind on it, but the main push was always our lower blend limit scapa from the single malt. And then our working with the blended Scotch whiskies, white heather, um, Chivas Regal, Royal Salute, etc. So not a lot of people know about the distillery top there. Oh yeah, Catherine, are you is that yes, you've been to Gonalke? Yeah, I'll say I'll take that as yeah. Um we look forward to getting as many people once this COVID thing is over and uh, everybody can start to travel again. We look forward to having you guys back. Everybody's welcome at Glenallachy. So let me uh, let me see if I can quickly, and I don't, I'm only going to show you a few images, so don't cringe here. You're not going to get a death by PowerPoint. Just to kind of help set the scene for the distillery that I'm talking about here. I, I might have been to Glenallachy. <laughs> Just, that sounds weird that I'm not sure. Um, You've probably driven past it. Uh, well, I, I went and I was brand new to Scotch and we went to 11 distilleries in five days. And I'd have to go look at my notebook to tell you for sure. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Five days. Wow. Yeah. That is, yeah. Uh, that's pretty hardcore, Catherine. Um, it was. And we had a driver. There were 10 of us. And bottles were passing while the driver was driving. So <laughs> it's all a blur. Oh, I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. So they were right in the heart of Speyside. Um, can you guys see that? Okay, I haven't put it in full screen because when I put it in full screen, I can't see you guys. Um, so there's Billy Walker. Um, there's Billy Walker, master blender. I tell you, what, he's laughing in that picture because we just. Has anybody heard of the Facebook club called Bung Ho Sniffers? No. <laughs> I think it's a I think it's a German stroke Scandinavian thing. So we were up there. It was myself and Clyde who works in marketing, and the three of us were there in the warehouses. And Billy was, was these are new casts, new wood that he just got delivered. So he's in a good mood straight away, and he was popping all these bongs and having a nose. And I said to him, Billy, you, we'll get a photograph of this and we'll send it off. You'll be able to join the, the bong hole sniffers. Of course, he had no idea what I was talking about, but it, it's a uh, if you go on Facebook tonight, if it's still around, it is a very, very, very geeky, um, I think German Scandinavian whiskey club. So that's Billy Walker there, um, in great humour. Uh, uh, let me try and find. Uh, oh, there's an interesting. Um, this chap here, Delmi Evans. This is a gentleman that designed Glenallachy Distillery. Um, Glenallachy was the fourth distillery he designed. Um, Jura Tower Barbin, uh, also for Scottish in Newcastle. Um, and so this was the fourth one, and he put a lot of work and effort into um, the design of Glenallachy. And incidentally, when it was first in production, everything was gravity fed. There was no pumps on site. So the entire whiskey making process was gravity fed. Okay, There was no, uh, no pumps. So by clever engineering, basically just using the height of a water source. So this is Ben Rennes, this hill in the background here, this is Ben Rennes the hill, and um, Ben Rennes the distillery is just down to the right. Glen Farkas is just down the road a little bit. Over the hill is um, Glen Livet distillery. Out to the left is um, Duff Town with all its famous distilleries. So this is our entire water catchment area here. We've got two dams, and by using clever engineering, we were able to, or Delmi Evans was able to get enough pressure in the system to make the entire whiskey making process gravity fed. Uh, that's just an old sketch. And so there's a distillery in the 60s. Let me try and that. There's a distillery now. Okay, so that's a distillery um, taken just, uh, just as we bought it. Apologies for all the builders' vans and things lying around. Um, so over here is the old customs house, um, and this is now our visitor center down here. Um, and right over there, so that first picture I showed you of the water, that's our water source right up at the back. There's Ben Rennes, uh, the mountain. In fact, can you guys see my mouse? So right when I move my mouse away, that red chimney, that is, the, that is Ben Rennes distillery, that there. And so our water comes all the way down here, piped in. And there is pumps now because the production was increased and they started to bring in pumps. Okay. Now there's the next part I've mentioned about the casks that we've got. Um, there's 14 of these big warehouses. We've added two little Dunnage warehouses. Um, 
there is 100,000 casks of whiskey on site at Benalake, okay? But they're not all Benalake. There's Pernod Ricard, uh, there's Glen Levitt stock there, there's Aberlour, there's grain whiskies, there's even some Glendronach, Benriac, etc. Um, but all those casks that we are buying, we are slowly but surely, if any of them haven't been on site, they're not already at the distillery, we're bringing them back, back to our warehouses so that everything is there for Billy um, to work with. And I think um, Brian was not asked about um, about uh, the recipes. With the casks all being on site, it just means that we can sample them and know them. It's just far easier to monitor their, uh, their development and see how things are, how things are moving on. Um, obviously, time, on that note, time is moving on, so maybe, maybe we should try a little 18-year-old. Um, everybody got an 18-year-old to hand? So again, this is one of our earlier bottlings. Again, this one is 46% ABV. Now, our later, later bottlings of the 18-year-old have a little bit more sherry influence. But this one, this, this bottling here, I think we'll find will be, have a very similar cast makeup to the 12 year old. First full bourbon, bit of PX, a little bit of all are also in there as well, I think, uh, and just a tiny little bit of virgin oak, okay? I'm just gonna nose it against and compare it against the 12. A bit more subtle, a bit deeper. I don't know if it's casting with your fruit, but I can get that banana note coming through a little bit as well now. Um, and again, for me, I always get honey, butterscotch, this kind of sweet. Um, do you know what I mean when I say butterscotch? You get, you guys get that in the US, it's like a soft tablet, something coming through. Um, hey David, one of the other things I thought was really interesting was actually the budget that you guys have allocated for uh, the wood and the different barrels that you're using. Could you talk about that? Cause it's a pretty, I mean, and maybe because I haven't heard it before, but it's a pretty staggering number and the investment's pretty significant. Yeah, absolutely true. And again, great question. Otherwise I'd have forgotten about it. Um, we, now bear in mind, we're a, we're a small company. So I mentioned how big Glen Alaska production was. It can do, if we ran it seven days a week, it could do 4.4 million liters of alcohol. That's massive. That's four times the size of Brewer Body, four times the size of Glendronach, goodness knows how many times the size of Kilhoman. We've shut production right down substantially, um, um, and focusing only on producing for single malt. So we, as a small company, and we're only filling around 100, 100 casks per week, are spending a fortune on casks. Does anybody want to take a guess at what our wood budget for cask. Now bear in mind, we're, we're only filling 100 new fill, we're doing a bit of re -racking. Who's going to take, anybody going to take a guess at what our budget for casks is for this year? Oh, why? It's nudging around for 2020, it's going to be in the region of about $1.3 million, which is a phenomenal amount of money. Um, you know, and, and again, I think that's just a testament to Billy Walker um, that this is a much, a, you know, economically, do we need to be spending that amount of cash? Probably not. As a, as a business, we could get away without spending that. But this is Billy's labor of love, um, and he's picking up little parcels of casks. Um, we've got some of the first growths there. We've got some of the, the Grand Cru's coming over. We've got a Colin Massari from, uh, from Italy. Uh, do a little bit with James Pepper, and um, we've got some Coval barrels as well. We're only buying the best of wood, we're buying it in, in small parcels, and it, it can be quite expensive that way. If, you know, if we were just buying standard barrels from one of the cooperages, you know, you're getting them all 100%, uh, there's no wastage. You know, if we're shipping in small parcels from um, direct from the US or from Europe, you get a little bit of wasted casket bashed in the, uh, in the, in the 
containers to get a leakage. Um, you know, you might not have a full container, so it's an expensive way of doing it. But it's it's testament to our uh, village drive for for absolute quality that we will not shirk on on the wood. Okay, um, I'm trying to think what else we've got coming in. Support pipes, masala, mosquitoes. Someone asked last night about uh, saterns. We do indeed have saterns casks um, coming in. Uh, <laughs> Both Billy and myself do like Tokai wine, uh, Brian. Uh, it just it seems to be a very challenging whiskey, uh, sorry, a very challenging wine to work with. And um, when I worked for Brew Party and Aaron's uh, UK distributor, they they both dabbled. Aaron, I think, first dabbled with a Tokai finish. No, I said before, Aaron's great whiskey, but that one just didn't seem to work. And um, Billy said that he's tried to do some at Ben Rear, and again, just couldn't get it to work out quite right, which is, is it, you know, Tokai is a fantastic wine. I actually, you know, I've got some Tokai down in the wine rack and it's absolutely fantastic, absolutely delicious. But when it comes to whiskey, Brian, it seems to be an unusual animal, a bit difficult to work with. Um, but I think, I think everybody keeps asking Billy about it now, so I think he's got the, uh, I think he's got the bit between the teeth that he's going to try, he's going to try and revisit it. Um, what else is he doing? Uh, Mizunara oak, uh, the Japanese oak, which is again is I, I've never never worked with it. I've never tried it. I think Shivers maybe did some, or more did some Mizunara. Um, Billy's got stores can access some casks, <clears throat> but I believe it's very difficult to work with. Um, but I think he's going to stick his neck out and and give it a go. Um, you know, we also have some other things coming. So. It's not just about the previous wines as well. Um, you know, the virgin oak we use tends to be American, and um, what Billy's actually went and started sourcing different species of, of oak. Um, so he's looking at, in fact, we're going to have this coming out um, this year, just a very, very limited release. We're going to have some where Billy's put the, uh, the second fall bourbon and then he's re racked it into. Uh, chinkapin, uh, so it's a species of oak, only grows in this particular area. Uh, we've got some French virgin oak and we've got um, some Spanish virgin oak. So different oak species growing in different areas, different air drying times, different cooperage, uh, different posting levels. So you get all the different, everything just gives a little subtle different nuance. Um, and again, that's just something that, that Bill is experimenting with. We're trying to look and we're trying to get some Scottish oak organized, but it's, it's quite challenging trying to get it all. You've got to find the timber and you've got to find the sawmill and then you've got to get a cooper to pull all that together and, and getting um, getting Scottish oak of the quality we need. It doesn't have a huge amount of knots can be quite challenging. Um, the bourbon cast from one to uh, at, at the moment, the new fill Scott that we're buying in um, are predominantly um, James Pepper uh, that we're working with, um, and we get that. You know, we ask them that they don't they don't get rinsed out. They get the moment they're tipped, they get bunged and into the container and shipped over, so that they're nice and fresh uh, for us to work with. Um, we don't have a cooper. Um, we don't have a cooper, so we we when we bring them over, and that's something I alluded to. If we get any in the car, if we buy say a container full of casks from Colin Asari or one of the wine houses are from um, James Pepper or Koval or whatever. Um, we, we might get five, six casks will be leaking when the time they get over. Um, so we, we don't have the facility to repair them. We will actually just sell those on to Speyside Cooperage or get Speyside Cooperage to repair them for us and then send them back down. So no, we don't, we don't have coopers on site. Okay. Guys, what did you think of the 18 year old compared against the 12? Are you getting uh, any different nuances? Always, I know it's, it's hard for Scotsman, but always try and keep the, the ones, in, as we go through the range tonight, try and keep the, um, try and if you've got enough glasses, keep that you can go back and compare and contrast everything that we're going through uh, through the evening. Is the Cooper a big part of the budget? Uh, like, no, it's, you know, it's, the only reason we don't have a Cooper is we just can't, just, we're just not, we're not big enough 
we're just simply not large enough to justify having a good bridge on the site. Um, you know, we just, yeah, I, think, I don't know what these guys can make, you know, maybe three, four casts a day, how many of them can repair. We, we don't have that. We don't have the need for that, unfortunately. Um, okay. Um, before we move on to the 15 year old, I'll flip back over and I'll maybe show you, um, I'll show you a little bit. It'll just give you a quick look around the inside of the distillery as well. Um, we do have videos which the production guys have shot during lockdown. Um, we need to get those, Sam, let's move on from, for you. We need to get them loaded up so that your guys can pull them down and use them. They're quite interesting. I think they're about five minutes long and it's just for the guys taking it through each of the stages. But I, I don't have them with us tonight. Um, uh, Philippe, uh, do you know if the barrels? We get bourbon and rye from James Pepper. And um, Billy's a great aficionado of rye. Um, it gives an extra, just that extra bit of sweetness and a bit more spiciness uh, in the mix. And we actually borrowed a, a rye, we borrowed a, a, a nine year old rye uh, finish. And it's quite interesting. I mean, I like it a lot. But it seems to be a real love it or hate it whiskey. Some people just think, mm, no, that's not the classic analogy we've come to know. Um, and others really go for it. So it's quite an interesting one. And it's Chris saying a bit more red fruit in the palate, berries. Definitely, I got a little bit more fruit on that 18 year old coming through. Um, so let me flick over to the, uh, and I'll just take you, show you inside the distillery. Um, so there was the warehouses. Now that is a big site. That is from end right up the end here. And yeah, it's it's over half a mile. So you know it takes it takes quite a while to walk it. Um, uh, hold on, I'm just trying to find this. Sorry guys, if I had it on the big screen, it would have been easier. Uh, right, this actually wasn't what I was looking for. <clears throat> I'm not sure how knowledgeable you guys are. But all the granality we're going to taste tonight is unpeated, okay? And um, with no smoke. Alrighty. Now, you, I've mentioned a few other whiskies tonight. Um, Kill Holman and Aaron, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> you beg your pardon, Lagavonic there. Some of these whiskies are smoky and peated and different flavour styles altogether from Glenelachie. If you think every single Scottish distillery, every single Scottish single malt, by law, is working with only three ingredients, water, barley, and yeast. How do you get all these different flavours, okay? So water, barley, and yeast. And one of the key parts one of the key ways of doing that is if you want a smoky whiskey, if you love a Laphroaig and a Kilhoman with that distinctive smoky peaty tang, right at the very beginning of your whiskey making process, when you've been malting your barley, if you want to get a smoky flavor note through your whiskey, when you're drying the barley out, and bear in mind, malting is a process of you take the barley in off the field, you steep it in water and you let it grow. You let little shoots come out. And what you're doing there is you're converting the starch in the barley to sugar. So as, as distillers, we are looking for sugar to make alcohol. Okay? So this is single malt. The barley must be malted. Every, everything we're tasting tonight, when I want to kill home, single malt. The barley must, must be made with barley. The barley must be malted. Okay? So that malting process, steep it in water, let it shoot. Let it grow. Let start converting the starches to sugar. Once that once that process is complete, you want to stop that. And the way you stop it is you just drive out the moisture, the remaining moisture in the barley. Okay. So right at the beginning, if you want to make a non-peated like the Glenallachies we're trying tonight, your barley, your malted barley, which has got all the little shoots. I don't know if you can quite see there, all the little green shoots. You'll put it on the kiln. Turn on the heat, drive out the moisture, and that will, that will stop the malting process, okay? You will have converted the starch in that grain of barley to sugar, okay? And it's an expensive process. 
So that and the and the, the grain type is one of the reasons that a single malt is more expensive than a blended Scotch whiskey. If you want to make a peated, smoky style of whiskey, so right at the beginning of this whiskey making process, before you turn on the heat, before you drive out the moisture, you load up your kiln with peat, and apologies if I'm telling you what you already know, peat is just a source of heat, it's a turf in Scotland and Ireland, other parts of Europe, probably in America as well. Um, when you burn it, it gives off a hugely distinctive flavour note. Okay, so right at the beginning of the whiskey making process, fill up your kiln with peat, and look at all that smoke there, that permeates and sticks to the barley, um, and that's what gives you one of the ways of giving you a slightly different flavour note. Okay, so unpeated Glenallachy, uh, or unpeated any single malt, just heat, drive out the moisture. You want to make a smoky, smoky peated style whiskey, and we're doing that at Glenallachy. We're doing our first ever peated distillation. Pile on the peat. Do you know when you're burning leaves in the garden, uh, and the fire's just getting going, and you get a lot of that thick smoke? That's what's going on there, and that is sticking to, to, the, uh, to the grains. Okay, and that is what you will taste in the bottle. 5, 10, 15 years later. It's something that the distiller has done right at the very beginning of the whiskey making process. Okay. Uh, so I'm just trying to find. Sam, Chris, how, how, how knowledge, Chris, how, how, or Drew, sorry, how knowledgeable is this crowd? Do you want me to go into a bit of detail about whiskey making or just skip through it? Uh, I mean, it's a pretty knowledgeable crowd. Uh, we do these pretty often. Um, so I don't think you need to get into. We don't want to get. We like, don't want to like blow the, the backside off people, stuff. right? Yeah, but but I do think that the you know some of the unique features, like whether it be you know the fermentation time and how much longer that is, like more of like maybe the unique aspects. But you know you can. That's what I'm going to. That's what I'm going to cover over. Um, that's exactly what I'm going to do now. Drew. Okay. So we've got stainless steel washbacks at Vanalake. Um Okay. Now. What that means, they're not as sexy looking as some of you go into some of the older distilleries and they've got beautiful Oregon fine and large. They look beautiful. But we love our stainless steel wash bags because it means there's minimal risk of infection and, and it means that we can ferment for a really, really long time. Remember I said at the beginning we've got this huge distillery running on pickover. It could do 4.4 million litres of alcohol. Right now we're producing around 500,000. What that means is we can, what we mash on a Monday, we're only in production four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is cleaning day. What we mash on a Monday, we will put into the, into the wash bags and we will ferment that for a full week, for 160 hours, okay? Which to best of my knowledge is the longest in the industry. Um, and we can do that because A, we've got the production capacity to do that. B, we've got these stainless steel wash bags, which is a very controlled environment. Um, and the reason we do that, Billy says, it, it just gives us more esters and an initial experiments. It's going to give us a little bit, more, even more of a fruitier spirit. Um, so that's something that we are doing just now. We've increased the fermentation time up to 160 hours. Okay. Um, so, as I said, best of my knowledge, nobody, uh, nobody else is covering that off in the, in the Scotch whiskey industry. Okay, something else unusual about Glenallachy. Um, Catherine, Catherine, maybe this is ringing any bells. Did you actually ever get in here? Maybe, maybe Glenallachy, you'll see, recognize some of these pictures. Who knows? We've got, um, remember I said at the beginning about Delmy Evans designing the, uh, Distillery to be gravity fed. If you actually look okay, here, we've got a horizontal condensers. Okay, so we've got horizontal condensers, and that was just part of the process to make it more efficient and uh, more energy efficient and then um, during the whiskey making process. And it's a little side effect benefit that it lets us control the temperature of the condensers. Obviously, if hot things rise, hot water rises, we can get a little bit more of a consistent temperature in there. And we haven't done it yet, but we will start to tweak the temperatures in these condensers as well to give us a slightly different um, style of spirit. So back in February 1968, the, uh, the left-hand side came into production. 
You've got two wash stills, two spirit stills, but very unusually for a distillery, we also have two spirit receivers, low wine receivers, and two spirit safes, okay, which is very, very unusual. And most distilleries you go to would be one in the middle, okay. So hypothetically, hypothetically, we could be making one style of whiskey down this side and a different style of whiskey down that side, okay. So very big stills, but we're running them very, very slow. We've got the heat turned right down. And so we're getting a lot of copper reflux action and getting the influence of the still on our spirit as well. Okay. Okay. So guys, any any questions so far on what I'm taking you through vanilla? Sam, you see you get the vanilla sweetness spicy coming through. Absolutely. So let's move. Let's move to the sherry boy. Okay. So this was launched. I can get the damn thing open. This was launched in um, August last year. So it came out a year after, um, more than a year after the Core Range was launched. Forty-six percent again. Just look at the color, guys. You can see that there's more sherry influence in here. Okay, so you've got sherry, you've got PX, hogsheads, and butts. Okay, so you've got the smaller cask, giving you slightly greater um, wood to liquid ratio, and butts. Okay, you've got Oloroso. PX is a very sweet style of sherry. And then you've got Oloroso, which, just to be general, is perhaps a little bit more nuttier. A different style of sherry. PX, hogsheads and butts, are also hogsheads and butts. Some of it, some of this sherry was 100% sherry, re racked into the cast I'm talking about, and some of it was American oak bourbon re racked into the sherry cast I'm talking about. So, totally different color. On the nose, Bit more fruit cake and um, rich, bit spicy. Oh yeah, yeah, different. The the mouth feel definitely thicker. Again, I'm getting I'm getting, I'm getting a little bit of underlying vanilla, but just a bit more. Bit more fruit, wedding cake, raisins, spices coming through. A little bit of mocha. Just a different, a different beast altogether um, from the first two whiskies we've tried. And that is the influence of the wood. So remember, I'm saying every whiskey distillery is working with the same two ingredients: water, barley, and yeast. Just by spending a little bit more time with the wood, working with this particular wood type. Um, you're getting completely, you're taking your whiskey in a completely different note there. Um, Dathan, I think I got plum. Yeah, absolutely. You get, you definitely get a bit more rich fruitiness coming out of this one. Just as a personal note, this, this is my favorite from the lineup. I love the 15. I, I think I think Drew it's been it's been the one that is I think it started to really make people aware of what Gonalaki is and what Gonalaki could be. And um, you know, obviously we launched back in June twenty eighteen. Ralphie picked it as whiskey of the year, the twelve year old. We got out there, people tried it. And then I think suddenly this this can only last six, nine months. With us having the distillery that much longer and having so many more casks back at the distillery to work with, you're getting, you're starting to see Billy really put his mark on on the um, on on the spirit and uh, on the whiskey. Uh, yeah, I think most people when they're trying the lineup will will, will go for the uh, the fifteen euro. Um, but you know, just I don't want to go on it too much, but just bear in mind. Gonalaki's on a journey, and that 15-year-old 
was a little bit further down the journey than the first 12 and 18 that we tried. So just watch this space in the core range. Sam, absolutely dates, fruit, figs, definitely figs in the 15 year old, absolutely. Um, the 15 year old is core range, Brian. We have, we have no limits with the core range uh, with the 15 year old. So um, you, can, uh, you guys can fill your boots. You know, and I, I, I think as people, there's great, great whiskey, uh, great whiskey houses out there, whiskey distilleries, McCallum, Madonna, Clinton Um I think when, when people get to, we, we can hold our own with those, without a doubt. They're all great whiskeys, particularly fond of Glen Farkless. Um, the fishing I, I working with Gondwana, I like that as well. I, I think this one, the 15 year old, and the rest of the range, you will see us able to hold our own um, with, with, with that, with, with, without a doubt. Okay. I think it's my favorite too, Drew. I'm going to go back and have a little. <laughs> Was well, this one in the ten? I just, I just think they're both uh, have this like beautiful uniqueness to them, and you know. Yeah, you know the ten, and we'll face the ten next. The ten's an interesting one. At cast strength, we thought, you know, and there'll be uh, people prefer the twelve. I think when we first launched it, the twelve, the, the ten-year-old cast strength actually was possibly more popular than the uh, than the than the twelve. But you know, the the only reason we did. A ten-year-old, a younger cast strength. So Billy had initially said we'll do a twelve, uh, an eighteen, and a twenty-five, and then as we we'll go on, we'll add a fifteen and twenty-one. Those things we've It must have been around. It must have been about November. It was absolutely freezing. I remember that. It was absolutely Baltic, um, freezing in the warehouses. And Billy and I were going through. I think we might be warehouse five and we're going through it and it was all younger Glenarchies. You know, it was all seven, eight, nine, ten year olds, so forth that we were trying. And cask after cask, we were pulling and having a lot of those little samples. It was like, wow, this is fantastic. It's drinking so young. And we, you know, Billy just kind of looked at me. I could just see him straight away he was thinking, you know, so we added a younger and the ten year old cask rent to the range, just more or less there and then we said, right, let's Let's do a, a limited release. Um, and I think batch one, we only did something like, you know, 2,000 cases worldwide, which is it's not easy trying to allocate that out. Um, but we, we weren't sure how popular it would be, and it's absolutely blown off the shelves. Um, I think it's a, batch, it's a batch one or batch two you guys are trying tonight. Uh, we're, doing, we're doing batch one. Yeah, I don't have a batch one, unfortunately. Um, it's all sold out in the UK, so I've, I've got a slightly different one. Um, you know, batch, batch one was fantastic. It's um, a lot of vanilla in there as well, and there's a bit more virgin oak in the batch one, so you're going to have a little bit more spiciness when you try it. Batch one was 57.1% alcohol. Um, you know, the one I've got here, this is, this is batch three I have, because it's all I could get my hands on. This is 58.2, I think it was 58.2 in there. You know, again, you maybe just see a little bit of the, uh, you maybe see a little bit of the, of the journey that, that the, the cast strength is taking as well. Now, incidentally, this, this, this one that I've got here, this 10 year old cast strength, um, batch three, I don't know how big Whiskey Magazine is in the US. I know Whiskey Advocate is, is quite well played and stuff. Like Whiskey Magazine, um, which incidentally also made Billy, uh, pick Billy Walker as a master blend of the year. They do their whiskey awards, uh, and you win. You go through all the various categories. It's quite a long-winded process. You do all the regional heats, etc., etc. Then you go through the London, the final in London, and you have a tasting panel of judges. And ultimately, they'll judge the best Japanese, the best space side, the best Lowland, the whatever, you know, the best bourbon, etc. Glenallachie, twelve-year-old, in a uh, ten-year-old. Sorry, going out to ten year old cast strength in a blind tasting against some big, big heroes was picked as best space out single malt. Um, you know, and that, that, that again is another tremendous uh vote of confidence. Um, so you know, it's quite it's quite a wide uh, ranging panel. So, yeah, we're absolutely delighted to win that one. Um, I think the fact it's a blind tasting was just uh fantastic. Um, what is Philippe saying? Someone enjoys sharing. I appreciate this. Yeah, absolutely. This is 
that point you're mentioning there, um, it's about getting balance of your spirit and your wood influence and, and getting it that each complements the other and you don't just end up with something that looks like it's been hastily chopped in another cask to get a bit of colour. Um, the reason we didn't bring out a 15 year old when we first launched is Billy was working on it. That was one he really wanted to make a hit with. So he held it back for another year. He knew he could get more sherry casks back from William Grant. Um, so that was why he's got the perfect hit of balance and um, that sherry rich fruitcake fix um, and the Glenalki spirit as well. So, you, you know, you're, you're getting the classic Glenalki notes coming through there as well. Um, okay. So quickly, quickly zoom back over, see what else. Oh, and let me let me share the screen. So I showed you the still house. It's just an old picture of the uh, of the stills getting delivered back in the nineteen sixties, back before the old health and safety days. This is a great the great British workman with his cloth bonnet. Um, yeah, hard at it. No coronavirus masks in those days either. Um, <laughs> that's it. Um, we're filling casts at three three different strengths. 63 and a half, which is the classic whiskey, uh, Scotch whiskey filling strength. We do some a little bit higher. at 68% as well. We're going to do a little bit at a higher ABV. Um, Billy just wants to experiment and see a little bit about the higher. The higher the ABV, quicker the penetration and the different flavours you'll pull out the wood. Uh, when I was at Brewer Cladi, we did um, X4, the quadruple distillation. And I, I think we filled it into the cask, not far off 90 ABV. Um, you know, and that was an interesting, that was an interesting one. It, I, I'm not saying it was a success, <laughs> but it was, it was experimenting. We're doing, we're adding, a, we're doing two film strengths, we're going to add another one, okay? That's a new, that picture there, that's a new filling store, which the guys were all pleased as punch with. I mentioned the warehouses, 14, if you remember the picture again, 14 big warehouses. Um, we've added two little dunnage ones. Um, two of these are racked for sherry butts. We've now, one of this slide that says what, two palatized, that's where we're holding stock for Shivas and Diageo, et cetera. We've emptied those and filled one of those with sherry butts as well. So we've got even more sherry stock. Ignore that completely about filling 50% to first fill, 30 to sherry casks. That's it's all changing altogether. It's it's such a moving feast. Okay. Just a wee reminder, Glenalki always 46% higher, chill filter, uh, and natural colour, that bit of bourbon on the right, and a sherry or a pork pipe, I think, with a little bit on the left. Um, Again, for chill filtration, again, for those that may not, and I'm sure you possibly do, it's just simply the process. At the time of bottling, you chill the whiskey down to about zero degrees or minus two degrees, and the fats and the oils that have been created during the natural whiskey making process will thicken, and you'll be able to skim them off. Okay. So why, why would people do that? Partly because it gives you a brighter, clearer whiskey on the shelf. Um, this is a process that started absolutely decades ago. Um, it gives you a brighter, clearer whiskey on the shelf. It lets you lower the bottling ABV to 40%, okay? Because otherwise you'll get a cloud or a haze. When you add, in fact, maybe when we do the cast strength, when you add, when you pour it, if you add a wee bit of water, you'll see a cloud and a haze, and that's the oils and the fats from the natural whiskey making process. If you chill filter, you strip those out. Okay. So on that note, I see, I see the oil pause thing. Let's, we should try the, we should try the, uh, the ten-year-old cast friend. Let me stop share so I can ask all these questions. Batch one, Sam reminds me of the twelve at cast strength. Yeah, it's just it, the, the batch one you guys have got, Sam, is just a bit more muscular. Um, let me uh, I'm running out of cups here. I've only got three glasses. Just let me dribble something around. So I'm going to be pouring batch three. Um, you guys in California are working with batch one. 
So I'm at 58.2. You're at 57.1 from memory. You guys have got a little bit more lighter. You've got a bit more virgin oak in your one. I've got a little bit more sherry in mine. Okay. Now, if you want to try it straight, absolutely. Feel free to do that. Um, say for me, from memory and batch one, you'll get a little bit more vanilla. Classic butterscotch honey, a little bit more vanilla, a little bit more spice coming through. Um, and I've got a little bit more um, sherry in things. I'll get a bit more figs. Fantastic. Now I was talking about for those of you that want to just on non chill fillers, you want to just put a few drops in and you'll see that oil and that cloud that, that kind of haze. That's the oils and the fats. So we don't chill filter. Most of the small independents don't chill filter. Um, some of the bigger companies do tend to chill filter so they can bring the ABV down to 40 or 43 percent uh, and so that the whiskey looks a little bit brighter on the shelf. And by bright, I just mean clearer, crisper. If you put a if you put a bottle of this, if you leave a case of Glenallachie in your car boot, your car trunk, maybe not so much in California, but in New York or somewhere it's in New York winter, then you go back in the morning. That whiskey, you know, that whiskey will be all cloudy, it'll be completely opaque, and cloudy and hazy. And that is that is the oils. Feel free, put one in your fridge. Put a bottle, or it doesn't need to be gone out like it, but any whiskey that's not chill filter, put it in your fridge and you'll see what I'm talking about. It. The oils and the fats will congeal and you'll get this real cloud and haze coming through in the whiskey. Um, okay. okay. Is there a port finished whiskey in the fight one? Do you want a port pipe finished? We've got 50 odd thousand casks. We've got different ports. We've got Ruby ports, Tony ports, Saturns, Marsalis, Muscatel. Uh, call them a sani um, <clears throat> with the rum, with the rye. We've got all sorts of casks. Um, so we did do, we've done various um, port pipe finishes already. Yes, um, we've done some in the UK. Um, we did a 10th anniversary bottle for Ralphie.com uh, and the 700 ml was a port pipe, 750 which went to the US, I think it was an hour or so. Uh, punching or whole head from memory. Um, so we, we've got a lot, lot of port uh, in the warehouse, and um, something Billy likes to work with. Um, Ganache is quite a strong, quite a robust spirit, so it can stand up to a lot of the stronger um, wood types out there, uh, and some of the other wines. Like, yeah, Madeira. Yeah, we've got Madeira. We've done Madeira. We've done Masala. Uh, do you know we've even done? We've even done for one market. Um, had to be the Germans, but we'll not make any jokes about them because you never know who is listening. We actually, the Germans specifically asked, could they get two wood pipes married together? Could Billy use his skills and marry and create a QV specially for Germany? So he did that. Um, and that'll be getting bottled later this year. Um, and I think it is, I can't remember what it was he married, but he took two particular woods, they went through the warehouse and he took two particular styles blended them together. It's still going to look like a single malt, but he's taken, to the point of this, he's taken a Madeira or a Marsala or a Port and married them together and um, just exclusively for Germany. So if we get asked, if people ask, we, we will do it um, as long as the quality is there. And Billy is, is happy with the quality. Okay. Guys, these are, these are great questions because otherwise I would be forgetting to cover most of it. Um, we haven't got any 100% matured at the moment, Brian. Perhaps, see if we filled new fill into a, into a, into a first fill ruby port pipe, Brian. Within five years, six, seven years, you might find the wood just start to overpower the spirit slightly. But maybe a second fill, I need to ask Billy, maybe we could do a second fill if we haven't already done it. Uh, you know, a cask, a port pipe, some port pipe casks that we've already used and we're filling for the second time. Um, there may be some new fill in that because then that just the cask is a little bit more subdued and you can get a little bit better maturation in a longer term, get, getting that balance right between distillery 
character and uh, my voice is going a little bit, gentlemen and ladies. I hope I hope I'm not getting too Scottish for you. It's definitely more Scottish, but I think we're bearing with you at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I think as I go through the drums, um, as I go through the drums. Um, okay. So I don't think I've got any more slides to show you guys. I think I've covered everything off interesting at the distillery. Oh, no, there's a good one here. I've got a good picture of Billy and Richard standing together. So Richard Beery is our operations director. There's Billy Walker. Uh, this is him um, up at the up, up at the uh, the water source. I think that one is a hen's head run. Ben Run is behind us. This is Sam at the Impex, the GBS guys. When when you finally get a chance to meet us in person, get you over to the distillery. Richard is a great guy, full of character, full of chat, talks incessantly, but he's also a little bit short. So whenever there's a photograph, a photo opportunity, Richard always hops, <laughs> hops up in something to give him a little bit of an elevation. But they're a, they're a great team. So you've got Billy Walker there, who's 40 years experience in the industry, Inverhouse, Burns Stewart, Benny Eckman, John Ark, now Glen Allake, uh, Maestro with Wood, um, etc. And then you've got Richard, who's more of a technical background. Um, has been involved with malting company um, and has helped uh, build and construct distilleries. He's involved with the Torah Bay distillery getting built in Sky and one in Japan as well. So um, they, they make a great team. Um, that's just, you know, something that is an interesting forward. Uh, so looking at the right here. Here's the guys. So there's Richard, uh, Lindsay, a warehouse manager. Please just punch with a new filling, a uh, new filling machine at the distillery. And this here is Lindsay demonstrating. Now, Lindsay has got decades. He, he joined us from Ben Rear, um, decades of working with Scottish whiskey, demonstrating to everyone. This is the first cask of Gonalaki getting filled. And the machine fills, it goes hell for leather, and then it slows down as it senses that it's getting to that you're filling a bar barrel there, so 200, 225 liters, whatever, it senses and it slows down. The machine's going hell for leather, fill, pumping in the new film. Lindsay's calmly assuring everybody that it will slow down, and it absolutely didn't slow down. That was the Gonalaki first fill, first cask, blowing whiskey or blowing spirit all over the place. So uh, the best laid plans of mice and men do go awry. Um, so that's it. Uh, what else does it say there? Filling station. We've, we've got the filling station. We've done the warehouse and we've cut production. First period production. Uh, we've done that. Bottling line. We may add a bottling line at the distillery. At the moment, we get our stuff borrowed off site. We share a bottling. Same people as Glen Farkas and Glen Goyne. Um, for us, it's a very, very small company. The, the, the economics of trying to do your own bottling is challenging. And we've focused on getting the quality of the whiskey correct. As time goes on, I think we'll maybe look at putting a small bottling line up at the distillery, um, even if it's just for our single cask products in particular. Okay. A nice picture of the sun setting up over Ben Rennes. Um, so, uh, the new make, how does it taste? Let's find out. <laughs> of course, I'm going to go in this as well. This is quite old, you make, Brian. This is February 2019. Now, this might be before our. Um, this might be. When did we start? Yeah, this will be the long fermentation. Sam, we should maybe get some of this. I don't know how we get it over to you, but at some point, we should look at getting some of this over to you guys in California. Um, I'll go pick it up, Sam. Just send me over, and uh, I'll grab it for everybody. I have about twenty guys that are eagerly asking for new <laughs> make because they use it during their presentations, and you know, especially with one hundred sixty hours fermentation time in Glenallic, I would assume it tastes pretty damn good. It is. It is. It is pretty good. I wish I had some of the older stuff to try here as well. Um, Catherine's saying it tastes ghastly. I, I don't mind you make this stuff is there. I remember trying it, it was very, it's very light, quite floral. A little bit of grass coming through there. It's not that I, 
Now, new make sometimes can be kind of vegetal, if that's a word to use. Um, it kind of almost, it's, it's not like that, it's very light and floral. Yeah, and I don't know, maybe it's subliminal, but I think I can get that classic Glenalachy vanilla coming through, and that already is very sweet. Um, we need to get that there. Uh, we need to get some of this over to you, Sam, um, particularly just now, because we're doing our, our period distillation as well. So we don't have any period Glenalachy stock. The distillery never made, laid any stock down. So we've got period whiskey getting laid down just now. Um, that's what we're producing. And we're using, at the moment we're using Speyside peat. Uh, I think Richard said it was from St. Fergus up near Aberdeen, uh, which is one of the main peat beds for feeding the Speyside distilleries. Anyone, that's, that's another nuance that gives your whiskey a different flavor. So we're peating very, very heavily, okay? Remember that picture I showed you of the slide with the smoke uh, infusing into the barley? We are doing that really, really, peeling our barley very, very heavily. But our barley, our, our peat is slightly different peat from the guys out in the West Coast. They're wet, they're, the peat that they've got has got a slightly different style. Ours is a little bit more drier. Um, and it just gives you different flavor notes as well, okay? So that's something else that will give, give you different flavor profiles. As time goes on, we're absolutely, we're gonna experiment again with, uh, with more, different styles of peat from different parts all around the country. And we've also done something that's very, very unusual, um, just what we're talking about period of whiskey. Um, is anyone a big fan of Optimore, the, uh, the, the period of whiskey from, from Brook Valley? Um, so Optimore is the period whiskey in the world, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's great whiskey, I used to work with them. Love, lovely people, lovely whiskey. When we were doing, and another way you can change the flavor profile of your whiskey, see when your spirit is coming off the still, if you want a more heavier, oilier spirit, um, smokier, La Freud, for example, run the spirit cut a little bit further. They cut a little bit further to get more of those heavier notes. So that's why they gain half, again, just to be broadly general, they can have a slightly different style of whiskey from Optimore, which is, or Port Salmon, which is heavily period. At Glenallachie, you've got this big distillery running in takeover, and the guys had a little idea of, we've got spare tanks, we've got spare capacity. Why don't we take a little bit, a little cut of a cut so as you're getting to the tail end, we're making heavily, heavily peated whiskey. And you're getting to the tail end of your run, you're starting to get some of that heavier notes, the smokier, the more developed peated characteristics. We actually stop, we've drained down the system, we've actually added extra pipe work. So that when we come to the end of our peated distillation, we'll actually take a little cut of that heavy, heavy, oily, but it's not so much oily for us because of our peat. It's more smoky and tangier. We've taken this, we call it a fractation, because it's a fraction of a cut. And we've kept that, taken that and we've put it aside and we're keeping it um, separate um, and filling it separately. And we've got that laid down in some of our best casks and it's absolutely developing phenomenally. Um, the balance of um, the, the Glenallachy spirit and the, but you've got that intense smoke and sweetness sweet peat coming through and and cracking oak it that is something that is really really coming on and something else just talking about when we're talking about peated mate whiskey and non-peated whiskey and i want to try not to get too boring here do you know when your distillery swaps from making unpeated whiskey to swap over to making start running heavily peated barley through, through the marsh, etc. You're going to have a little run, the bearing in mind that we're putting into the wash still, distilling it once and then taking it back into the, the low wine receiver. When you swap from unpeated to peated, you're going to have a little distillation that's going to be semi-peated. 
that make sense? So you follow me, semi period, you know? And then when you get to the tail end of the run, you're going to have exactly the same. You're coming off your period, period ballet and bringing in your unpeated ballet. Again, you're going to have one distillation that's semi peated. Now, normally, that would just get put into the, the peated production run because you can't have it con contaminating your unpeated whiskey. Okay, I hope you're following me so far. At Benalke, again, because the distillery is so big, because it's running in takeover, we actually, when we're swapping from unpeated to peated to heavily peated barley, we actually stop production and we drain down the unpeated low wines and put them in a separate tank. Okay, because we've got all these spare washbacks. Um, we've got something like 10 washbacks or eight washbacks there. And we're only using five. So we will take our unpeated low wines and put them into a tank and keep them. And then when our first run of heavily peated barley comes through, it means that the cut Peated foot spirit, which we take away and fill the cask, is 100% peated. And then when you get to the tail end of the run, when you get to the tail end of your peated whiskey making process, you're swapping back to unpeated, we'll do exactly the same process. We'll stop production, we'll drain off the, the, the heavily peated low wines, we'll drain them off, and we'll bring back the unpeated. So I hope that makes sense. I hope I didn't bore the backside off you trying to explain that, but it means that our heavily peated granalaki, which you'll see coming out in the years to come, is always 100% heavily peated. Okay. Um, good, I'm glad you found the entry. It's kind of a hard concept to explain. Okay. Sounds more complicated, David. I thought it was just a matter of cleaning the pipes, but looks like it's well, you, more than that. You understand what I mean, Sam? When you, when you, cause, you know, you're distilling twice. So you've actually going to have either unpeated or peated. So when we're swapping over, we're going from unpeated, we'll take that away altogether. We'll, take, we'll drain the system down, we'll take the low lines out. Then, then we will bring in. That's the way we do it. Um, a lot of the other guys will just swap over production and the semi-peated will just go in with a peated production, you know, and it'll just get lost. But not, there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. We just do it differently because we have the capacity to do it. You know, for all the time it takes, during the silent season, we added in the extra pipe work um, to let us do that. We added in the extra pipe work to let us take a little fraction of a cut when we get to the back end of the period run. You know, it's, it, it's got, when you come and visit us, Sam, we'll talk you through it and we'll let you taste the results. Um, you know, maybe when I get a chance to come over to California and get a little bit of the sun, I'll maybe bring some little uh, sample bottles in my pocket as well while you try it, because it really is something fantastic. Do you know, it's, it's developing so quickly. We had always thought that we would bring out our peated whiskey in about five, when it was five years old. I think the way this is developing, we might bring some out next year as a three-year-old, um, just as a little taster to say, look, this is our first distillation. You know, we're not sure for certain yet, but um, I think we might do it. The way it is developing um, is absolutely fantastic. Okay. So, guys, I've been talking about you for one hour and a half, uh, and we haven't even got to the last whiskey yet. Okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, apologies. I don't have a Glenalke 25 year old here. I thought I did. I went down in the cabinet, and I absolutely did not, unfortunately. So, what I've got. You guys have got Glenalke 25 year old. Um, from memory, got a little bit more sherry influence in it. Okay, but a little bit of. Um, so I think some of that is just classed as sherry, but because the records from when that was filled weren't as accurate as, um, you know, nowadays it's right down to the nth degree of, you know, whether it's PX, it's a halted or whatever, you know, every, every, the exact sherry. Type is detailed. If you see an older bottling and it tends to just say sherry butt, it's because the sherry type hasn't been recorded. And I think that is with the Glenarchy 25 year old, it just says sherry butt. Um, so we're unsure. Possibly also PX. Um, 
So I don't think there's any virgin oak in, in the 25, you know. Um, so it's 48% alcohol. Normally, the Glenallachies we're trying either 46 for the core range or for cast strength. Billy just felt when he was putting the 25 year old battings together that he felt it was a better balance and a flavour at 48%. Okay. So that's what you guys have got. What I've got is a 1989 single cask, specially bottled for the UK. Maybe I'm spoiling myself, but it's a Saturday night in the UK. and I've been on holiday all week and I go back to work on Monday, so I, I think I'm entitled to, do, to spoil myself. In fact, here, here we go. This one, for example. Can, can you guys see that? So it says Sherry Buck. So that's an example from 1989. It just says Sherry Buck. The other thing I'm going to show you here, if you guys can see there, 60% alcohol. Okay. So this was bottled at 29 years old, 60% alcohol. Okay. And I think, and it's one of my few, remember the picture I showed you of those big Glenallachie warehouses, big stone breeze block, a lot of casks in them, asbestos wood. It's a very, very consistent temperature. So you're not getting a huge fluctuation. And it tends to be a little bit colder as well where we are. The cold wind comes down off Ben Minnis. So I think that keeps our warehouses a little bit cooler. And I think that's why you'll see, and I'm sure you'll see them in the US in due course. Uh, I think there's some 1989 out there already. I think the US one might even be 60.1%. Uh, you'll see some older Glenallachie casks um, with a higher ABV on them. So anyway, guys, um, Slange, enjoy your 25-year-old. I'm going to have a little 29-year-old here. That's what I've got. Thank you very much. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to sit and I'm going to savor this whiskey. I think I've covered Glenallachie, but please, any questions when I'm here for the next 15 minutes or whatever, I'll stay as long as you guys want me to stay and talk about Glenallachie or anything in general. Uh, David, first, you know, I want to say thank you for, for all the information. Um, you know, I think we have a pretty, pretty good whiskey group out here and it's always fun mm -hmm. to bring stuff in that, um, you know, does things a little bit differently and brings some different stuff to the table and being able to introduce people to new whiskeys is, you know, what I love to do. And I know that's what you guys love to do as well. I think also one of the things that is, has been really striking to me from yesterday to today is, you know, you guys seem just so much more aware of your place in the whiskey world where you're just kind of like, Hey, we're continuing to learn and we're open to suggestion and, um, you know, I, you, you don't have to get into the details of it, but yesterday we were talking about some packaging that um, you weren't mm -hmm. involved with and you're looking forward to changing um, when it came to some of the other stuff that you guys had worked on, not any of the Glenallachies, but uh, I just, I just really find it refreshing, you know, cause it's this, this is a process. And I think when people try things and they immediately write them off, it's just like, like, no, this is going to continue to build. And like you said, it's only, you guys have only been involved really, you know, with the brand since 2017. So I'm looking forward to what you guys come out with in the future and, um, you know, just watching the flexibility from, from like people who really know what they're doing is cool to see. I think, yeah. I, well, thank you very much for Ken Ward's group. Uh, I, you know, I think that there's a few things. People forget we, we only bought the distillery three years ago. We only launched two years ago. We came long way in a very short time we've done things some things we've done very very quickly others we've taken our time on uh, the 15 year old we spent a little bit more time on uh, you're going to see i can't emphasize this enough it's the start of a journey and you're just going to see glen Allen getting better and better and better as tight as time goes on um but the other, the other thing to bear in mind as well is um you know we were due to launch in the uh, march 2018 Billy was like, do you know what? I'm still working on the whiskey. So I'm going to put the launch back three months to June. The most new start whiskey companies absolutely simply could not do that. That would be, let's get something out ASAP. I remember Brovadi in the early days, I was surprised on many. Let's get stock, get, let's, get, let's get barrels in the cash. We were hugely fortunate to have Billy as shareholder, the master distiller, the man in charge, 
We're not driven by any short-term needs. And I know I probably sound a bit like I'm going into the world of marketing. I'm not. We're not driven by marketing uh, directors or the urgency to, to please shareholders. It is simply about Billy Walker in his 70s, must have been about the bush, on his swan song of making great whiskey and really wanting to make Clonality something special. Um, you know, he's a man that owns a company. He's a man that makes the decisions. And he's a man that puts his money behind it the whole time. He's a man that says, we're going to spend $1.3 million on casks um, because I only want to work with the best. You know, it, it, it's one of the most unusual whiskey companies I've been involved with. And, you know, and I, 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 I worked with Brew Paddy back in the insanity days. Uh, you know, yeah, great whiskey, great people. Well, my God, <laughs> yeah. Um, this is an unusual and a completely different way. And you know, all these other whiskey companies out there have something restricting them. You've got like some, uh, you know, the Glen Freddy, Grants, McAllen, all making great whiskey, but they're driven by shareholders or they're driven by something. Whereas with us, it's just Billy saying, "This is what we'll do." And then it comes, it comes back as well. It comes from like, what do, what do Impex or import are in the US? What do they want? What, what does the US market want? Well, if we, if we, we'll do it, you know, within reason, we, we, we'll do it. We can, we, we will do what the consumers want. Um, and the question is, called, what's the, the biggest cost of making whiskey? Uh, yeah, the electricity is, yeah, your kind of general running cost is tight, but I think uh, for us just now, it's probably wood. Um, will be our biggest cost uh, and then after that it's just your general running costs of the distillery um, to go through. Um, well look guys, you know, thank, thank you very much uh, for your time and letting me join join you by, by Zoom. Um, I hope, I really do sincerely hope that in, in the months to come we'll be able to travel and get over to see my friends in California and maybe get to do this in person. Um, Maybe I'll be a little bit easier to understand when I'm in person. Um, I think, yeah, I can chat. Philippe is asking about McNair's. Um, so McNair's, McNair's when, we, when Billy, when we bought the distillery from Pernod Ricard, we bought Glenallachie, we're brand name, we bought the distillery, bought all the stock. We also bought White Heather, which is a blended Scotch whiskey, and it was a huge blended Scotch whiskey in this day, like over 1 million nine liter cases. Uh, and McNair's, which again is another big uh, blend, blended Scotch whiskey. But in the, as, as the age of mergers and acquisitions, the companies want to focus on global brands. Okay, so we bought McNair's, and we it's a blend that we relaunched it as a blended malt. Okay, now just be clear so McNair's is a blended malt. So when you see a Chivas Regal or Johnny Walker, they're a, they're a blend of Scotch whisky. So they, a blend consists of maybe 70 of this bottle, the bottle of blended whisky, depending on the age and the quality of it, could be ending up to 80% of grain whisky, which can be made from any cereal, made in column stills, and it's a lot cheaper to produce. And then it's dressed, flavored with a variety of single malts to give it flavor. So that's what a blend is. Grain whisky, then flavoured with uh, and dressed with single malt. A blended malt, and the key word is it's confusing terminology, a blended malt is all malt whiskey, okay? But from more, this is Glenallachy single malt, so this is from Glenallachy distillery only. Blended malt is single malts from more than one distillery blended in together, but there's no grain whiskey there. That's a crucial difference, okay? So McNair's is our blended malt. Um, the, the range in the US is called Lum Reek. Uh, Lum Reek has come from the old Lum is chimney and Reek is smoke. And there's an old Scottish saying, Lang me a Lum Reek, which means to wish someone a, a long hell, a long and prosperous life. Uh, what about a Scottish history there for you? So McNair's Lum Reek is a blended malt. There's three expressions. There's a milky vintage or a no age statement. A 12 year old and a 21 year old. Okay, each one of them has four single malts. Two of them are from Speyside and two of them are from uh, Isla. 
And one of the space sites is, of course, Glenallah Kent. It's older Glenallah Kent, each of the three releases. So Billy sourced the other single malts, the two from Isla and the other space site. The two from Isla are pitted. He brought them back to Glenallah Kent Distillery. He blended them together. But then instead of bottling it, he actually filled it back to a variety of different casts. There's some sherry cast there, there's some bourbon, there's some virgin oak. I think there's a little bit of red wine. He filled it back to these casks to let it all marry together. And then I think it was after about 15 months, he said, that's it ready. So that was when we drew it out of the casks. Billy did his final vatting of what we're actually going to bottle. Um, and that was what we bottled as McNair's. So two Islas, two space sites, including all the Glenallake and all the ranges. 46% uh, unshelled filter. Uh, natural color. The 21 year old is 48% again, and the 21 year old won world's best blended malt. Um, but if you're looking for a smoky, if you're looking for a nice smoke in the nose, look for the, uh, the, the no age statement. He's got a nice smoke up front, and then you'll get the other flavors coming through. The 12 year old and the 21 year old are a little bit more subtle and a little bit, you'll get the smoke just at the back of the palate, okay? So McNair's is a blended malt, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's one of my favorites. I, I I drink a lot of McNair's, I'm not quite partial to it. Okay, okay, Philippe, I hope that helped, uh, helped someone off. Guys, I'm here if you want, if you've got any more questions. Brian, yeah, sir. Brian, we'll go with you first if you want. Oh, Sam, Sam, you go first. There we go. There we go. I'm alive now. I had to turn the unmuting off. <laughs> <laughs> you know that we uh, at, at Impacts do kill Homan. So yeah. one of the big things is obviously uh, with Glen Allocky being at zero parts per million exposure to peat, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, your peated one, can you tell us what part per million you are on the peated, and it's, even though I know it's a different form of peat than what Isla uses, okay, mm -hmm. that's going to help us guys to describe it in intensity of peat. Sure, no, absolutely. Well, you, you don't need to worry about it for a wee while yet, uh, Brian, because we haven't even bottled it yet, but I can tell you it's 80, 80, 80 ppm, okay, so it's heavily peated, it's heavily, heavily peated, by the way. Um, and bear in mind, if you've kept up with me, we don't have this semi peated at the beginning or the end. So it's 100% heavily peated distillate that's going into the cask. Um, and then we've also done a little special cut as well. Okay. So it'll be a, it'll be a different flavor profile from Kilhoman. Um, Kilhoman's fantastic whiskey. So uh, I'm now, <clears throat> now that we're sharing the same import from the US, I'm going to have to speak to Anthony, see if we can do a little swap set. See if I can tempt them with some of Space Side's finest on a little bit of Kilhoman. Um, I, I like your whiskey. Where, where are you speaking from, Brian? Is that your office? I like the, the whiskey collection behind you. Good man. A man after my own heart. I hope they're all open. Or is that the pension fund? No, that's the pension fund, and it's over 500 bottles. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Fantastic. Sam, Sam I think I'm you, like you had a question. From, from, from Impact's JVS Warehouse, but that's okay. Um, Drew, you, <laughs> you, you introduced um, David to the group, but I wanted to say a few words about the group. So, you know, River Whiskey, River City Whiskey Society is one of my favorite groups in the United States. They're still growing. Uh, the guys are so enthused about the whiskey and about learning about the whiskey, um, you know, led by world famous Ro and, and Drew. And, you know, I see many, many other people that I see every time Drew does his um, events, you know, Catherine would be probably the one and then Philippe and, and many, many others. So I want to thank you guys because they're not just there to taste the whiskey, they buy the whiskey and, um, you know, they're very supportive to our brand. So I want to thank you very much for for being so much of a support. Yeah, I'd absolutely second that, Sam. Um, you know, we, we're a small independent company, 
Uh, 100% Scottish owned, married, independent. So it's the support of you guys. This, this is our marketing budget, is uh, sampling and tasting and, and working with Impex. You'll not see billboards and so forth for us. Word of mouth, quality of whiskey. Um, so I'll just echo Sam's words and say thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, Drew, thanks for organizing it. Um, much, very much appreciate it. So, um, okay, guys, well, that's quarter to 11. I'll go down. I'll go down and join um I'll go down and join my good lady. I'll maybe watch a Netflix movie. And then it's my last day of holiday tomorrow and then back back to the cold face on Monday. Um so guys, guys and girls, thank you both. Thank you all very much. I hope you enjoyed the introduction to Vanalaki. I'm not used to doing tastings by screen. I'm sitting here in my slippers. So it was very much um rambling in an informal. So uh hey stuff. I look forward to getting over to California uh, in, in the flesh. Okay, guys, I will head off. Um, Drew, Sam, Brian, everyone in River City, thank you very much. Cheers. Good. Thank you so much, man. And I just put the link back in the, um, in the notes. So you guys, if you want to pick up any of the bottles, you can certainly do that. We do have a couple other offerings available in California. So if you love this and maybe want to crack at that 29-year-old, please let me know. Um, I'm actually going to put my email into the chat right now. So if you guys have any questions or anything further that you'd like to like to get, please just let us know. But ultimately, uh, thank you guys for attending today, David. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, you know, if I have to sit through two presentations, two days in a row, I'm glad it was with you. So <laughs> you're too kind. You're too yeah, kind. I'm, look, I'm looking forward to, you know, to meeting you in person and, and all that stuff but you know everybody stay safe stay healthy and uh keep drinking good whiskey and we'll see you guys at our next event okay cheers, cheers.